The next speaker, just before our panel discussion, is uh, Andrew Hart from the um, UK Food and Environmental Re uh, Research Agency. Over to you. <laughs> Not quite yet. Over to okay, you. Okay. So, um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Teresa, for inviting me. Um, uh, I'm going to start with a confession, uh, which is on my second slide and relates to my um, uh, and relates to the title. Uh, so the title says recent international developments. I'm going to talk about some recent developments, uh, namely the ones here. Uh, and I'm not going to try to, in the short time I have available here to go through the detail of these. I'm going to concentrate on some of the key principles that I think we all need to get in order to use these types of methodologies well uh, and to achieve the objectives that we're aiming at in this session. And I'm going to attack those key principles through some examples. And the first one is one that some of you all seen me use before. It's the example of the Red River uh, in the USA. It flows through the city of Grand Forks, and every year when the, the snows melt uh, and the rains fall, uh, the river rises. And so the city of Grand Forks has built a levee. And in 1997, that levee was 51 feet, and it's designed to protect the town from flooding, the city from flooding when the river rises. They also have risk assessors and risk managers whose job is to assess how high the river might rise and make decisions about how to manage the risk that it will flood. And in 1997, the prediction from three months earlier than the flood actually occurred was 49 feet. 49 foot prediction, 51 feet levee. The outcome, the actual flood river height was 54 feet over the top of the levee. The consequences of that were really severe. Extensive flooding, fortunately no loss of life. Um, uh, about 11 blocks of buildings burnt down, I think. There was a, a cost estimated, uncertainly, at between three and four billion US dollars, and loss of credibility and trust for both the assessors and the managers of those risks. What do we learn when we look back at it retrospectively. Well, Nate Silver has done an assessment of that, and he says that it would have been possible to uh, assess the uncertainty at the time, and if you'd done so, you might have ended up with an assessment of plus or minus nine feet for the uncertainty on that prediction of 49 feet. Now, it's clear that that's information that would have been very valuable for the authorities and indeed for the stakeholders. What do we learn from this example? We learn some things about what risk managers and stakeholders need to know about uncertainty in this particular case and generally. They need to know how much higher might the river rise. But that's not enough, not just how much higher in qualitative terms, they need it quantitatively because it's essentially a quantitative problem. They need to know whether it might rise above the height of the levee. They also need as much of the uncertainty to be taken into account as possible in arriving at that range because it wouldn't be so helpful to have a range and then a list of other uncertainties that you haven't included in the range. You're leaving the risk manager or the stakeholder to assess how much those other uncertainties add in to the overall range. And when the upper end of the range exceeds the levee height, they're going to want to know how likely it is that the levee will actually be exceeded, the levee height will actually be exceeded. They want to know how likely it is that the, um, this doesn't work, that the uh, actual height will be in the upper part of the range and not in the lower part. So we need information on how different the outcome might be and how likely the adverse outcomes might be. The second example is this word likely. And here I'd like to uh, involve you a bit in a little experiment. What probability do you associate with the word likely? I hope you've got pens and paper. What I'd like you to do, if you'd be willing, is to write down your probability expressed as a percentage between naught and 100%. Yeah, seriously, I'm going to give you about 15, 20 seconds to have a go at that. Just write down your probability. What probability do you, do you associate with the word likely? Serious experiment. Yeah. 
Okay. So, anyone got 100%? Put your hand up if you got 100%. Anyone? Anyone over 95? 95 or over? One, two, couple. 90 or over? Okay, a few more. 80 to 90, between 80 and 90. Some more. Between 70 and 80. Some more. Between 60 and 70. Some more. Between 50 and 60. Some more. Less than 50. Oh, okay. A couple of less than 50s. This works every time. I was nervous, but it works every time. Words are ambiguous. They mean different things to different people. And the graphics on the left is my safety net in case it didn't work today. Uh, it's an example. It's, this has been done with many different groups of people by social scientists. This particular example is a colleague of mine, Alan McLeod, who's, I think, in the audience somewhere. He did it with plant health risk assessors. Uh, and the bottom line is that people mean different things by these words. They interpret the same word in different ways. What that means is that when we're sitting as scientists around a table, um, uh, a set discussing uh, what to put in our opinion about the likelihood of an adverse outcome, if we use that word likely, we, we can't be sure that we mean the same thing by it. Someone might mean less than 50%, someone else might mean over 95 Okay? It also means the risk manager and the stakeholders don't know what we mean either, and they will form their own judgments about it. So this is clearly a major challenge for qualitative expressions of uncertainty, that they will be interpreted and misinterpreted by different people in different ways. So we need to try and be a bit more quantitative. And this takes me to example three, which comes from a television program where uh, Barack Obama was explaining, describing the process by which he arrived at the decision to attack the compound in Pakistan, where he thought that uh, where it was thought that uh, Osama bin Laden might be hiding. He said, some of our intelligence officers thought that it was only a 40 or 30 percent chance that bin Laden was in the compound. Others thought that it was as high as 80 or 90. He went on, at the end of a conclusion of a fairly lengthy discussion where everybody gave their assessments, I said, this is basically 50-50. Right? That might mean, sound like he means, he doesn't know, but it, he doesn't. He means about the same as tossing a coin. We couldn't know for certain. Even though I thought it was only 50-50 that Bin Laden was there, I thought it was worth us taking the shot. What do we learn from this example? Quite a few things. We need to quantify likelihoods if possible so that you can understand the, each other and get away from that ambiguity that I demonstrated with the experiment just now. And we need to do that for expert judgments as well as when we're doing statistical analysis. Different experts may give different judgments. That's what you'll discover. In fact, that's one of the reasons for quantifying is to find out that they actually have different views. And it's okay that different experts have different judgments because they have different knowledge, different expertise, different experience. They may have different information on the problem in hand and they may be interpreting it differently. It's important to know that that is part of scientific uncertainty. And it's important for the risk manager to know about it. Ultimately, it's the risk manager's understanding of the uncertainty that will matter. That's what's going to drive the, the decision, not any one of the individual experts. It's the risk manager's understanding. And it's the risk manager's job to decide what to do about it. And why is it their job? It's because it involves weighing up that uncertainty against all the other costs and benefits and political and economic and legal and social and cultural consequences of alternative decisions. Those are not matters for us as assessors, as scientists. Those are matters for uh, risk managers and for stakeholders. So, a number of key principles then. And um, it's not as if these are key principles that we've been unaware of. They've been established for over 12 years in the Codex Working Principles on Risk Analysis. And they're quite clearly summarized very much more succinctly than I've just managed to. Uncertainty should be explicitly considered at each step in the risk assessment and documented in a transparent manner. <coughs> Trying to be as comprehensive, systematic as possible. 
Expression of uncertainty may be qualitative or quantitative, but should be quantified to the extent that is scientifically achievable. Responsibility for resolving the impact of uncertainty on the risk management decision lies with the risk manager, not the risk assessors. And sadly, we've made precious little progress in implementing these principles since 2003. So one of the things that uh, I hope that this session will help to do is to stimulate us more in that direction. These principles, these same principles apply to all of EFSA's scientific advice. I mean, I gave some examples that were nothing to do with EFSA, but they apply to all EFSA's advice. What we need to know, what risk managers need to know, how different might the outcome be, how likely are the outcomes that are of particular interest to the risk managers. We need to quantify as much of the uncertainty as possible. We don't need to quantify it as in as sophisticated a way as possible. We need to quantify as many of the uncertainties as possible at whatever level it's appropriate to quantify them in terms of sophistication. And we need to leave risk management to the risk managers. Uh, and uh, this applies uh, whether you're looking in, in uh, contaminants or additives, so you, you have the estimates of exposure or comparing them to ADI or TDI, you need to know how different the outcome might be and how likely it is that the exposure is above the ADI or TDI. If you're looking at um, uh, nutrition, then uh, you might be talking about intake, inadequate intake. If you're looking at GM, for example, you may be comparing GM trait with a conventional equivalent, uh, and so on and so forth. Right across EFSA's work, it's the same principles apply. So in this recent guidance that we've uh, been drafting and which was out for public consultation uh, in July, uh, we've tried to provide a framework uh, for realising these key principles. And we started with a systematic identification of uncertainties. And I'd like to illustrate that graphically here. We end up with a list, with a, a set of uncertainties that we've identified uh, in, in, in our assessment. And uh, uh, Morris showed in his, uh, uh, one of his slides one of the, the sort of typology that we offer to help people with doing that, or part of it. Once we've done that, we then offer a flexible toolbox of assessment methods, ranging from very simple, um, uh, from qualitative methods through to quantitative, and from very simple methods through to very sophisticated methods. But we're not asking people to be very sophisticated all the time. We're saying, start simply. Refine as far as you need to. Don't refine any further. Once you've got to the point where you've characterized the uncertainty well enough for the risk manager's purposes, then you can stop. At any point in the assessment, you will have assessed some of those uncertainties quantitatively, maybe. You may not even assess any of them quantitatively, but most often there'll be at least some assessed quantitatively, some qualitatively, and there'll be some uncertainties that you have not assessed individually by any method. You'll have listed them, but you won't have assessed them individually by any method. There are always more uncertainties than you can assess individually. So, we need at the end to be able to express the overall uncertainty and we need to tr try to do that quantitatively. It's fine not to assess all the individual uncertainties quantitatively individually, but we need to try and be quantitative about the overall. That sounds like a tricky problem. How do we do it? Well, we've got the individually quantified uncertainties over here on the right. Um, and so what we're going to need to do is to quantify the contribution of the others by expert judgment. And then we're going to need to combine those either by calculation, which is preferable, um, or by expert judgment to assess the overall uncertainty. Still looking perhaps a little bit complicated, let's look at an example that shows that we're doing this uh, already uh, in effect. This is an example from an EFSA opinion on T2 and HT2 toxins. In that opinion, the hazard was assessed and the tolerable daily intake was set at 100 uh, nanograms per kilogram body weight per day. Exposure was estimated and the aim was to estimate a 95th percentile uh, for different age groups, one of which was toddlers. And one estimate for that was 23 nanograms per kilogram body weight per day, assuming that non-detects are zeros. When non-detects were assumed to be equal to the limited detection, the answer was 91. So we've quantified already 
with this, in a simple way, with a range from the, a worst case to a best case, one of the uncertainties affecting this assessment. Other sources of uncertainty were assessed qualitatively using a table like this. We don't, in the guidance, prescribe any particular way for constructing lists of uncertainties or expressing them uh, qualitatively. We give a range of options and this would be one of them. A list of sources of uncertainty in both exposure and toxicity and some idea of which direction they push the risk estimate in, whether they tend to cause overestimation or underestimation. Crucially, the panel made an expert judgment of the overall uncertainty. They said the CONTAM panel concluded that given the uncertainties, the risk assessment of human and animal exposure to the sum of T2 and HT2 toxins is more likely to overestimate than underestimate the risk. That's a quantitative judgment. Less than a 50% probability that risk is underestimated. It's a bounded probability judgment. So we can do these sorts of judgments. Furthermore, they concluded there was no health concern. That implies at least a couple of things. It implies a judgment about the margin between the exposure and the uh, TDI. Uh, and it implies uh, some understanding between the assessors and the risk managers as to what probability of exceeding the TDI might be sufficient to imply a health concern. So many assessments already imply quantitative judgments about overall uncertainty. Uh, and so what we need to do is to try and make that a bit more transparent, a bit more tr uh, documented and transparent, uh, and uh, 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 show the reasoning behind it uh, more clearly. It's quite difficult sometimes to make these judgments, and so we suggest as one option, using a scale of probabilities for doing this, to give you a wider range, rather than just saying more likely to underestimate or overestimate, let's have some, some terms that represent different levels of probability and see if people can choose from that uh, to describe the certainty, the level of uncertainty they have, or the probability of particular outcomes of interest to the risk manager. And this scale is adapted from a similar one used by the IPCC uh, in climate change. Of course, it's important to record the rationale, the reasoning for these judgments. Uh, as was said earlier on, um, it was suggested that that's one of the things that expert elicitation doesn't do, but actually good expert elicitation techniques record the reasoning for the judgments as well as the judgments themselves. And indeed, we say in the guidance that it's ideal if you can actually use formal expert elicitation judgments to make these choices uh, uh, when, especially when the problems, uh, the uncertainty is large and very important to decision making. But it's also okay to use it more informally uh, when that's proportionate to the problem. Of course, there are some limits to quantification. And uh, I imagine, I'm afraid I wasn't here yesterday, but I imagine Andy Sterling will have talked about the, uh, the limits to quantification, the difficulty of quantifying uh, some types of uncertainty, particularly when there's ambiguity, complexity, or ignorance. And the EFSA guidance recognises that, EFSA, that assessors may not always be able to quantify the overall uncertainty because of this. And it says that in such cases, they should not give qualitative expressions that imply quantitative judgments. So if we can't say how likely, if we can't pick a likelihood level on this scale, then we shouldn't use the word likely in describing our conclusions because we'll be implying something and people will interpret it as meaning probabilities that we don't believe we can support. So we need to be honest about when we can't quantify the uncertainty. And instead what we should do is we should report that the overall uncertainty cannot be quantified. We should consider partial quantification, conditional on assumptions about the unquantified uncertainties and make very clear what those assumptions are and we should highlight and describe those unquantified uncertainties for the decision maker and stakeholders because they are going to be key to the decision making process. I'm going to go on briefly to talk about the IPCS guidance um, which uh, can be seen as uh, complementary in that it focuses on uncertainties in a particular area, chemical hazard characterization. And it goes into more detail, it's more prescriptive about what to do, and it offers also an Excel spreadsheet tool, making it very easy for people to apply it. 
One of the principles that emerged in that guidance is, uh, and that's also said elsewhere, is that when you're going to quantify uncertainty, you must be precise in defining the parameter you're going to estimate. And this actually turns out to be a bit of a challenge in hazard characterization because existing definitions of reference doses and the like are ambiguous. For example, the tolerable daily intake is defined in EFSA's uh, FAQs page on its website as the dose that can be ingested daily over a lifetime without posing a significant risk to health. Significant, what does significant mean? Exactly what do we mean by risk? Exactly what we mean by health? So these are, this is another form of uncertainty that's very often present in our risk assessments. Uncertainty about what actually we are assessing. So to get around this, the IPCS guidance offers a definition called the HDMI, the hazardous dose, um, the human dose at which a fraction or instance I of the population shows an effect of magnitude or severity M or greater. And it provides tools for quantifying the uncertainty of that dose, of that estimated dose. Those tools are based on databases. So this is moving into a more data-driven, model-driven form of uncertainty analysis. Uh, and uses databases on intra and interspecies variation for multiple chemicals, combines it with statistical modeling, and generates estimates of the HDMI and its uncertainty. They include a case study on deoxyvalanol, divalanol, sorry, um, uh, where the BMDL10 that they were using for the example was for body weight effects in female mice, 170 micrograms per kilogram body weight per day. If you apply the conventional approach, Divide by 100, the conventional reference dose would be 1.7 micrograms per kilogram body weight per day. If you use the HDMI concept, the HD0501, the hazardous dose where a 5% effect um, or more will be experienced by 1% uh, of the population. 90% confidence interval for that is 0.44 to 19.2. The, what they call the probabilistic reference dose, the lower end of that confidence interval, 0.44. So that's the dose where there's only, where there's a 95% chance that the true HDMI is higher than that. That's the coverage it gives you. It quantifies the coverage that that dose gives you for the uncertainty. And it also tells you what the coverage of the conventional reference dose was. And in this particular example, it was 68% coverage, 68% sure that the conventional reference dose would be below the true HD0501. Uh, implications for risk assessors. Um, what are the implications of wrapping up for both risk assessors and risk managers? The first thing, and perhaps the most important message I would like people to take away, we need to apply the codex working principles. They are a clear, succinct statement. They are fundamentally the appropriate thing to be doing with uncertainty. We need to be using them uh, in our work. The EFSA guidance provides a general toolbox for this. It's applicable right across EFSA's work. Indeed, it could be applied to any type of risk or uh, scientific assessment. It's flexible and scalable to the needs of each case. You can apply it even if you've only got a matter of hours to complete your assessment, or you can apply it if you've got uh, a massive assessment lasting several years. Basic approaches in the guidance require expert judgments which are comparable to the current assessments and not a lot more. But what they give you is increased transparency about those judgments. The IPSS, IPCS guidance uh, on hazard characterization uncertainty offers specific tools that fit, can be seen as fitting within that EFSA framework, but they're specific to chemical hazard characterization. And You've seen that in what I presented, that it involved not just some modeling and some data, but also some moving forward of the paradigm for defining what the reference dose is that you're trying to assess. So some modifications or some ev evolution of the paradigm for the assessment as well as, as new methods. And I think we will find that that may be needed in other areas too, where the more definition is needed of what is exactly being assessed. One key implication is that people will need training, they'll need specialist help, and EFSA is taking steps to provide that. Very quickly, some of the implications for risk managers and stakeholders. 
what they get is better information on uncertainty, the range and the likelihood of possible outcomes, and a list and description of unquantifiable uncertainties that they need to be aware of on top of that. They get more transparency about the justification for expert judgments and for the variation, more transparency about variation in expert opinion, which is in fact part of scientific uncertainty. Certainly part of the scientific uncertainty as seen by the decision maker. All of this will provide a better basis for decision making, a better basis for the judgments that risk managers and stakeholders need to take about the choices they will make to manage the risk and to choose options that reduce the chance of bad outcomes, increase the chance of good outcomes. And this would include participatory approaches of the type that, again, I imagine Andy Sterling would have talked to you about yesterday. This isn't something that's exclusive to a linear expert-led uh, treatment of risk and uncertainty. It can work in a participatory approach as well. And at the end of the process, we'll have something very important as well. More transparency about how the impact of the uncertainty on decision-making has been resolved. What level of uncertainty did the risk managers accept on our behalf uh, for managing this risk? What probability of adverse effects have they accepted and so on? I'm not saying there won't be some challenges ahead. There will be, for sure. Um, one is culture change for risk assessors and managers, recognition of the need for all this and understanding of people's roles in it, the roles of the assessor and the manager, and actually that's part of what I've been trying to get at in today's talk. But also new methods and a bit of a culture change about being more quantitative. And finally, communication, one of the words in the title of the session, very important, we'll need new strategies for dealing with uncertainty in communication. And in a, in a, in a, in a nutshell, we need to find ways of addressing uncertainty in communication and not avoiding it, which is what happens most of the time at the moment. Thank you very much. Sorry for everyone. <laughs> Uh, well, we can take a, a small number of questions before we convene the panel on this particular talk. Uh, if there, yes, here in the front. Here's a gentleman in the front, the second row. Okay, thank you, Andy, for your very clear presentation. I like it, and uh, as usual, I mean, it stimulates reflection and it stimulates contradiction. And also what you said is very convincing. I wonder whether it's applicable in every case of risk assessment. And I will take again an example in my field of competence, which is uh, allergy and allergenicity. And uh, you explain very clearly uh, that when we use the word likely, I mean, it doesn't mean anything. But I wonder whether using a figure would change anything as well. And I have discussed with several risk managers, and I say, what would change in your judgment and decision if I say this compound is very likely to be allergenic, or is likely to be allergenic, or maybe allergenic in certain segments of the population? And every time the response was, it would not change anything in the judgment. Then why should I make an effort, I would say an artificial export, to give a false impression of certainty of knowledge, saying, okay, it's 70% or 60%, which I absolutely do not know, if it doesn't change, I mean, the final decision of the risk manager. Okay. So, first of all, my experience is different. We, in the course of making the EFSA guidance document, we went and spoke to risk managers in Brussels. And while some of them were uh, nervous about having more information on uncertainty, they actually rather prefer just to be told that the chemical or the product is safe, uh, because that basically does their job for them. Uh, uh, others were very receptive. They wanted to know uh, how much uncertainty there was, and they wanted it in this type of form. They, they liked the idea of knowing, okay, you're saying it's safe, but what's the likelihood actually that it's not safe? And can you explain that to me in terms that I can understand? And um, uh, actually the theoretical underpinning for this goes to back to statisticians called De Finetti and Savage in the 60s, uh, who, who dealt with it by constructing the concept of a fair bet. What we're doing with these probabilities is we're asking people to say, what do you think would be a fair bet for this outcome? And what that means, that gives it an objective meaning, because in principle it means if you, for example, take a set of judgments, 
all of which you gave a 50% probability to, it means that you think about half of them will turn out positive and half of them negative. It has a defined objective meaning. It allows you to express your subjective judgment in a way that is objectively understandable. And as I'm not aware of any other way of doing that. It also opens up those, those probabilities can be used in probability calculations, which means that you can combine multiple uncertainties in a more rigorous way than you would be able to by thinking about them in your head. So there's a whole bunch of advantages to doing this. I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, there are challenges. Uh, one of the things that is gonna help, I hope, is that EFSA are developing training and an e-learning module, which would be nice if it was available outside EFSA as well, uh, to help people in making these probability judgments. But I, I think it will really improve the clarity about how much uncertainty there is. One more question uh, on this particular talk over there, and then we move on to the panel. Uh, Magnus Wang, you have to hold it quite close to um, your... Magnus Wang, W Scientific. Um, I wonder if people are forced to give um, percentages of, of how likely something is, if that at the end makes you feel uh, sure about something and in fact you don't often know. For example, if you have just two species yeah. with an ecotox endpoint and you want to extrapolate to, to, to another species, um, well you just don't know. You can make up a figure but sure. probably there are so many things, yeah. so at the end it doesn't really help. And the second point regarding um, extrapolating, what you just mentioned, um, I think it's important not only to look at how statistically you can approach these problems, but also what we heard in the previous talk, how to use validation to address uncertainties. Because I think in most cases that's much more helpful. Okay. Uh, so just quickly a couple of quick answers. The first one is that uh, if you've got little information, little evidence, then your uncertainty interval for the thing that you're assessing will be very wide. And that will show people how uncertain you are, and it will show them in, in the terms that matter for the assessment. It will show them how different the real answer might be, either based on statistical modeling and data, which of course is preferable, or if you can't do that, if you haven't got that available, then on expert judgment. And that is better than the expert sitting there and just saying, well, I think overall it's unlikely there's a risk. Um, that's a much less rigorous, much less meaningful way of expressing it. Um, and, and the second thing is, no, I've forgotten the second part. The second was about what you mentioned, the st statistical approach to, to get to the overall range of the uncertainty. Because often if you go um, bottom-up, you will get huge ranges, but if you do validation, you will uh, va validation. go that was very directly yeah. at the real uncertainty. Okay. So the thing with validation is it's an interesting concept. I mean, what's this idea? You know, things are valid or not valid. You know, what do we mean by that? What we mean is they have some level of probability that they're giving the right answer. It's, it's, it, what, we, what we should get from validation studies is not a sort of a, a, a nice sticker that says this is perfectly correct and every time you use this you will get the right answer. What we should be looking for from validation studies is generic estimates for the uncertainty of that procedure that tell us when you get this result, um, actually there's a 90% chance that it's the right one and a 10% chance that it's not on average. Or actually the result you get will be within a factor of three of the real answer 90% of the time. That's the useful thing you can get from validation. The idea of validation is a sort of yes, no, black and white uh, 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 sticker I, 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 I find very hard to. I think it's, it's not a useful, it's very, it's rule based basically rather than judgment and uh, evidence based. So, thank you. There's one question from the ether, so uh, from the web stream, which uh, has come, is from Kimberly Yeager, Abbott Nutrition, and the question is, in the setting of industry business, who do you view as playing the roles of r the risk assessor as opposed to the risk manager in a company? So, uh, in terms of, it okay. seems the roles might be harder to define. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, actually the, the distinction between risk assessor and risk manager was sort of uh, emphasized earlier on, early on in the, the, um, the Red Book, which was this book produced in the US by the, uh, the, the NRC, I think it was. Um, and uh, uh, at the time they said that they, they did not mean they should be isolated or completely separated. They should be functionally distinct. And actually it, it doesn't have to be different people. What, what's important is that you are clear about when you are assessing the science about what might happen, what the outcomes might be, and when you are making judgments about what society or 
the company or whoever it is wanting the outcomes to be. So in quite a lot of organisations, I mean, EFSA is fairly unusual because it has a mandate which specifically restricts it to risk assessment and leaves risk management with the Commission. But many organisations actually have a degree of both uh, in within the organisation, uh, including some of the national food authorities. Uh, and within a company, there will be within the company some people whose primary responsibility is to advise on the science, but they might also have a role in contributing to the decision making. So it could be a mix of the two. Um, uh, and I, w I wouldn't want to uh, try and prescribe as to what, what model will work best. I think it depends a lot on the context. Okay, um, so thank you very much for this uh, very illuminating talk. Um, I, it's a, let's, a round of applause maybe just to conclude this segment. Um,